Hey, okay, this is chapter 15 from McKernan's book. It's on clinical microbiology. This is a quick review and introduction to the kind of uh, microbiology things that you'll be doing in a veterinary practice or for a veterinary practice. I'm going to talk about sample collection and processing and some bacterial culture and identification. So we'll, we, we will discuss this a little bit more in class, um, but some things that I want you to start thinking about. What types of culture might we do in-house at a veterinary hospital? Um, what types of cultures do we not do in-house in a veterinary hospital? So the types of cultures we're going to do in-house are things that would be easy to grow in-house, but that would not be infectious to people. Because we're not set up in a veterinary hospital to have an isolated room where we can grow things like anthrax, um, things that could be uh, highly contagious and detrimental to people. But we could do things like um, dermatophytosis culture or DTM culture, um, where we're growing ringworm um, in a fairly safe environment. Um, so those are the kinds of things. We could do some, some bacterial cultures. Uh, we could do some fungal cultures. Um, but we're not going to grow things that we th think like MRSA or things that we think could be uh, contagious to people. Why is it important to handle samples precisely according to, to directions? Well, because if we damage the samples, uh, they're not going to grow appropriately. Um, what stains do we have available to us in the practice to help identify or organisms? Well, we have the Diff-Quick stain, we have the Gram stain, we might have the right game stain as well. So those are the three that we often see in practice. Um, I do have examples of those stains in a Word document in your eLearn course shell, so you can go through, the, the, through those at your leisure. With sample collection, first of all, you need to know where to get the best sample while avoiding the normal flora that's there. So we all have bacteria, some, some of us have funguses on our skin, but what is causing the disease process? What is causing, uh, causing uh, the infection? We need to find that spot and get directly in that spot without finding something else that is normally growing there that's not actually causing the disease. We also want to do a sample of the um, bacteria or the fungus early in the disease process. And a lot of people kind of hesitate to do that. They just want to treat with antibiotics and antifungals without doing a culture because it might be cheaper. It's actually in the long run typically cheaper to run a culture, get the appropriate antibiotic, and get that animal on that antibiotic as soon as possible. You know, make sure you have the right amount of the sample so it can be gro grown out um, easily. Um, you don't want to go back and have to sample again. And in some cases, we have to um, grow these things out on a broth culture. So if you have a suspicion of a uh, type of bacteria that it might be, then there are some precautions that you want to talk to your lab specifically about in order to grow it out. Broth culture, uh, we'll typically do that if we have um, uh, bacteria in the blood. So some sample uh, collection. So we're going to normally, so this, this, these little black dots here are normal bacterial, bacterial flora. So that's great. We have a in, uh, normal bacterial uh, flora on our skin. Uh, we, we're going to have that, right? Um, in this line here is where we might put antiseptic to kill the normal flora so we don't have that contaminating um, what we're trying to get. So if we have a closed body area like blood or an uh, abscess or a joint or a cystocentesis or underneath, um, not, not exposed to the outside air, what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to um, do, use an antiseptic uh, at that closed area, take a needle and go into the potential pathogen area and draw the sample uh, without drawing any sample on the way in or out. So we don't want to aspirate as we're going in or as we're coming out. So we're just getting this sample inside this space. If we have a communicating body area, so we have urine or what's called a fistula. Fistula is an opening that an abscess may, makes from the inside to the outside to allow it to, um, uh, to express out. Um, or um, from the cervix, so endocervix. Um, then what we're going to want to do is try to get some of this out first because it'll have normal flora there. And so catching urine midstream, that's why we do that. If we have a superficial body surface, we're going to have contamination with normal flora. Now, typically, we're going to have a lot more 
a potential pathogen than normal flora. So hopefully our lab will be able to tell what's normal flora and what's the contaminant. But the example of some superficial body surfaces where we're going to have contaminants would be conjunctiva, um, so around the eyes, um, mucous membranes, uh, wounds, feces, so things we can't necessarily clean up um, before. We, so if we used antiseptic here, so we can use antiseptic around this area, try to reduce the normal flora as much as possible, and then catch capture things midstream. But here we can't use antiseptic at all because we'll clean out the potential pathogen as well, if that makes sense. Okay, so we're going to aseptically prepare sample collection sites only where possible. So around communicating body areas and over closed body areas. Uh, we're going to use the appropriate needle, collection vessel, or swab. Special handling. So when we're talking about tissues in surgery, doing a biopsy, or during a necropsy, when we're doing taking it from an animal that is, is deceased, um, we have uh, blood cultures. Um, blood cultures are uh, specifically taken because uh, in a specific way, because blood cultures, this is these are bacteria that are moving all throughout the body. So we, what we want to do is take multiple cultures. We call this transit transient bacteremia. It's bacteria moving through the body. So multiple cultures, at least three samples, 30 minutes apart from separate veins. So I might get one from the left cephalic, from the left saphenous, from the right jugular, um, for, as an example with aerobic and anaerobic swabs. Um, so aerobic means that it's uh, these are bacteria that like to grow in air or oxygen. Anaerobic are um, bacteria that like to grow with in the absence of air or oxygen. So we do have to be careful how we're going to separate those swabs because they're going to be processed differently. So we're going to separate swabs for staining versus culture. Um, the slides will not be sterile. Urine, we need at least half a mil. We like to get at least um, eight mils if we're doing a, a, a number of different, um, or three, three mils really, if we're doing a number of different tests, we'll do it. Um, we want to get for culture a cystocentesis, but if we do not get a cystocentesis, it's really, really important to identify the, the method of collection because uh, your lab will need to know that. Some other places where we might get some samples, uh, bronchial alve alveolar lavage or transtracheal wash means that we're getting some mucus or, or um, sputum from the lung area or from the tracheal area, uh, and so we'll want to um, transfer those appropriately. Joint fluid, um, anything we get from the joint, anytime we inject a joint or put something into the joint, we have to be very, very careful because the joint is really sealed off part of the body and we need to make sure that we don't inadvertently um, inject something into into this area. Anytime that we're going into a closed body area, we have the chance of introducing infection where we might not have an infection before or introducing a new infection uh, to this area as well. That's why we use the antiseptic around it. We don't want to create more of a problem. So that happens with joint fluid. Um, with milk, uh, we're going to want to get um, uh, midstream milk, um, and that has to be handled um, um, specifically. And then feces has to be handled specifically. So these all have specific instructions where do you get this information? You get this information directly from the lab that you're sending it to. And very often in class, I can show you the book for uh, a, a lab, like IDEX lab, where they give you the book of instructions of specific um, ways to send in samples. These are examples of culture swabs, and they're color-coded based on what kind of um, medium you're using to grow bacteria or funguses, anaerobic or um, aerobic. Um, this swab needs to be kept sterile unless and until it's in the potential pathogen area. And then you put it directly back in here because you don't want to contaminate it. So a lot, of, a lot of things that we have to consider with shipping. We have to consider the, the weather for the day. We need to consider how we're shipping it. Make sure that we're not having any spillage, uh, contamination of anything. Um, I'll tell you that um, 
delivery drivers really do not like boxes that leak because uh, they never know what's in those boxes. So you have to be very careful to pack it um, with care. When you're looking at things, um, when you're ship, getting ready to ship things, it's really helpful to look at things before you ship it. So if you have the ability to take a slide and stain it and then send unstained slides away, then I challenge you to do that because um, if you can look at these exudates, these draining fluids, this thoracic fluid before you send it away, you get a pretty good idea of what you might be starting to treat for before you get those answers because it could be 72 hours or more before you have any answers on this pet. Um, so you want to make sure that you're preparing the slide um, appropriately and different books will tell you different things. Uh, just um, there's, there's information out there. Um, you can check for protein. If you have a liquid, you can check for protein. You can put it on a refractometer, look for protein. If you can stain it, you can look for leukocytes. You can look for bacterial numbers. Um, we have to keep in mind that there are some flammable stains out there. We don't typically use them, um, but th these are stains that uh, typically we have labs that are more trained than we are use them um, the other thing we have to keep in in um, in mind is that uh, when you are talking about using a microscope using it appropriately doing your Kohler uh, illumination uh, making sure you're looking at stains in the in the correct light um, that's really important um, making sure that you have maybe some control slides so you can compare your slide against so being educated in this field can be helpful for gram stains, what we're looking at with gram stains are cell walls. Gram positive um, bacteria takes the gram stain in, and so that is purple. Okay, it's because the cell wall is largely composed of peptidoglycan. Gram negative pink cells are missing that purple stain. It gets rinsed off because those cells can't retain it because they have a double lipid bilayer that protects them from retaining that cell. So they have an inner and outer cell membrane and a periplasmic space, so it protects them from that gram stain. So we can identify different um, bacteria based on whether they're gram positive or gram negative and you will learn that in microbiology it's just one way of solving the mystery or, or uh, taking the clues that you have and getting an idea of which direction we're going to need to go with therapy so this is a gram positive cocci most likely it's something like a staphylococcus this is a gram negative rod most likely it's something like e coli and having an understanding of what this is can lead you to the path of use, choosing the right antibiotic. So understanding that gram, certain bacteria are gram positive, certain bacteria are gram negative, that when you look at a, uh, a slide of fecal matter with a bird, that it should be um, staining more gram positive than gram negative. And if you're seeing that not true, then that's something, or I'm sorry, more gram negative than gram positive. If that's not true, then we may need to do something for that bird. So th keep this in mind that gram stains can mean, um, can give you a, a good idea of what's going on with, with bacteria. So there are some challenges. Um, if we have neutrophils or protein, those are also going to stain. Um, so that's why we need a control slide. Um, sometimes viscous fluids will stain, um, will change the stain a little bit, um, so that can challenge us. When we examine a, uh, exa examine a gram stain, um, we're going to scan it first at low magnification, then get it up to the oil immersion lens so we can really see if these are cocci or rods. And we want to make sure that we have that control slides staining uh, in mind as we look through it. We want to consider the source of the, the material, uh, and then we might want to compare a right base stain to to the gram stain to get an idea of that what we're seeing is um, appropriate. This is an example of an acid fast stain. This particular stain identifies cells with mycolic acid in the cell wall. So acid fast stain identifies mycolic acid. Um, there are a couple of different procedures. Most of them are some type of zeal nielsen stain. It is not something that we typically do in practice, but it is something we potentially could do in practice. Um, it, anytime we're doing an acid fast stain, um, we are typically looking for mycolic acid or a mycoplasmic um, uh, bacteria, like a tuberculosis uh, bacteria, um, that's very specific. I just want you to know what acid fast means. 
So again, you want to look at the control slide. Uh, you want to make sure that you are um, uh, looking for the, um, acid fast, uh, which stain bright pink to re uh, red, or non-acid fast, which stain green. Um, you do want to be cautious when you call a slide positive uh, and just be, uh, be careful. But we are looking for mycobacterium species, which is like tuberculosis. Bacterial culture and identification. Um, so we have a lot of different types of bacterial culture. Here's washed blood, cow blood, agar, mycoplasma agar, salt agar, camp agar, maconchi agar. This is a very common one for um, isolating gram-negative bacteria. Um, what we're looking at are, are different foods that will help us to isolate very specific uh, bacteria. And I have a video here when you're on your regular um, uh, lecture, uh, PowerPoint lecture, you can um, review the procedure by, by pressing this button. Um, but microbiology is, uh, is a great class to learn how to um, uh, inoculate, what we call inoculate these plates in a, an appropriate manner so that we get an idea of how much is growing. Okay, So if you are going to culture in your um, clinic, you need to know what type of agar to use, how you inoculate it, how you incubate it. And then when you have something growing, how are you going to identify it? How are you going to record it? So some uh, different ways of identifying. Again, we can look at gram staining and morphology. So are we gram positive, gram negative? Or are they rods or cocci? So that gives us uh, one clue. Then we can start looking at biochemical tests. We have the catalase test. We have the oxidase test. We have motility. We have hemolysis. Uh, we can, from these four tests, we can make a presumptive identification. There are ways of doing definitive identification uh, through uh, doing like DNA testing. Um, and there's some commercial identification kits as well. This is a uh, motility test where you take um, a, a metal rod that you've put into a growing culture and you get all these little bacteria on it and you stick it into this little gel. And if the bacteria, you can see this bacteria um, moving across this uh, gel, you can tell that it's a modal bacteri um, bacteria, it moves. If it stays in one place, it doesn't move. And so that tells you that we have uh, modal versus non-modal bacteria. And that can help you identify it. This is the hemolysis test. And this is how much, uh, this is a blood auger. And this is um, a bacteria uh, that is eating the blood. So it is breaking down red blood cells. So that tells you that the, uh, the bacteria hemolyzes. Okay. Um, so these are different tests that will tell you how to identify um, a specific bacteria. Here's some specific um, special culture procedures. A fecal culture is cultured to identify pathogens that cause diarrhea. Now we all know that feces has um, bacteria in it, that normal bacteria, it's there for digestive purposes. Um, but if we have too much of the wrong bacteria, we can have some problems. Blood cultures inoculated immediately upon collection. So as soon as we get blood, we have to put it into the inoculation uh, tubes. Uh, we have to be very, very careful not to contaminate those blood cultures. Um, urine cultures, um, the number of organisms is important for determining of uh, likelihood and severity of infection. So, so um, quantified means that we're counting your, the bacteria because often urine will have a little bit of bacteria in it, um, should not have much. So we have to um, count it. Milk culture is the same way. They're going to have some bacteria in the milk, but it's the count um, that uh, we need to keep in mind. Some common bacterial species in veterinary medicine. Um, Gram-positive cocci, very common, especially staphylococcus. Gram-positive rods, um, acid fast bacteria, gram-negative bacteria. Um, gram-negative bacteria, you have to grow on McConkie's auger. Um, no growth does not rule out gram-negative. Um, gram-negative bacteria has, in the past, been harder to kill than gram-positive bacteria. Gram-negative bacteria is a little bit more resistant to certain antibiotics. Pasturella is a Pasturella multocida. There's a couple of different strains, but Pasturella is a common bacteria that we see. It causes diseases in, in rabbits and cats. 
Um, they don't often grow here and they're slow to convert oxidase reagent to positive, um, so they're a little harder to grow out. Anaerobes, we often find anaerobes in the GI tract. If they are obligate anaerobes, they have to not have air um, and they're very difficult to culture and they can be either gram positive or gram negative. Spirochetes and curved bacteria in the urine and mucosa can be difficult to culture and they're potentially zoonotic. And, and I do have seen a fair amount of spirochetes in fecal um, uh, uh, fecal material as well. Spirochetes are often, they're spiraling bacteria and they're often moving um, so they're easy to see. Uh, curved bacteria often are as well but those are difficult bacteria to culture and difficult to treat. Mycoplasma bacteria are not visible on a gram stain. They have to use, you have to use an acid fast stain because they lack cell walls. Uh, and then there are other organisms that are obligate intracellular organisms, meaning they have to live in a cell, and if you're taking them out of the cell, they will not survive. You cannot culture them. So uh, antimicrobial susceptibility or sensitivity. So when we talk about culturing, we're talking about growing it out. When we talk about susceptibility or sensitivity, we're talking about how do we kill it? How sensitive are they to um, medications? So why would we do a sensibility or sensitivity? We want to decide what antibiotic we can choose. Okay, so there are a couple different methods we can use. We can use a broth dilution or a micro broth dilution, which is uh, this here where uh, we're using color to tell concentration. So this is oxacillin concentration using micro pipettes. You're putting in the exact amount of concentration. Um, this is for Staphylococcus aureus and for methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. You can see the difference in the color um, of the growth of the uh, material. So we are still growing um, uh, uh, MRSA in higher concentrations of oxacillin versus Staphylococcus aureus, we are not growing um, that, uh, that bacteria as we get our concentration of oxacillin in, as it increases. Okay. This is the disc diffusion or Kirby-Bauer method where you're using little paper discs that are impregnated with certain um, antibiotics and you drop it into this culture of bacteria. So this is bacteria that's been grown on a culture and you drop these discs in and the bacteria does not grow. And we measure that distance, that minimum inhibition concentration. We measure that distance to see if it's if the drug is really susceptible to it or is it slightly, these are resistant to that drug. See, there's no uh, there's there's growth around that, so it's not doing anything. Uh, we have some we have a lot of susceptibility here, but we have kind of what we would call an eye or it's inhibitory, but it doesn't really stop a lot of growth. So we have to look at these minimum inhibition um, concentrations to make sure that we are understanding how how susceptible is that um, bacteria to the drug. Fungal cultures or mycology. Um, we do have to be careful. We will do fungal cultures in practice, but these ringworm is zoonotic. You can see there's this person is wearing gloved hand around this cat. Um, this cat has some obvious scaly lesions. If we turned on a black light to this cat in a dark room, these scaly lesions would probably show up as a green apple um, light, which would be a positive woods lamp for dermatophytosis or ringworm. If we're going to do a ringworm culture in-house, we want to have a separate cabinet where we do that. Um, if, uh, if we don't have that, we want to ship it to a diagnostic lab. Um, we always need to identify the fungus that is growing because not only zoonotic or ringworm funguses grow on these cultures. So we will always want to, um, using gloves, uh, take a tape scotch tape and press it in the fungus and stain it and look at that fungus under the microscope. Um, if we have a highly infectious fungus, um, we may need to do um, make a clear statement if we submit this um, because we don't want to infect our laboratory either. Um, the only fungal cu cultures that we perform in a veterinary practice are dermatophyte cultures. 
this is called an entray dermatophyte uh, media uh, and this is um, some fungal material was put onto this and we've got a positive result here for a fungal culture and we've got the name of the animal and the date that it was done and this needs to be checked um, a pro uh, daily to see if we have um, positive and we should probably be wearing gloves here and clean your fingernails. Um, this is a dermatophyte culture. This is a fungus that is growing on this culture, but it is not necessarily a dermatophyte culture. So we would want to take scotch tape the, with the sticky side down and get a little bit of this uh, fungus on that and then put a drop of stain on a slide and put the scotch tape on the slide and get a look at those the, the um, spores and stuff that are growing to identify it. This is an example of what a woods lamp or a black light will show you. It's a uh, black uh, light here that you can see these uh, fluorescence. Um, uh, and this is and this person is not wearing gloves and they probably should be. Uh, but you can see it's fluorescing right by their hand. Uh, so they probably now have ringworm as well. It is only 50% accurate to do a wood slamp test. So if you have a negative wood slamp test, it doesn't necessarily mean that the animal is negative. We want to culture it and then identify it. And the way we do it is just pluck a little hair from around the lesion, or we can brush it with a new toothbrush, or we can collect it from nails uh, with clippers. Because a lot of nails that look a little funky, um, a little rough or brittle, um, can be um, contaminated with fungus. We're going to gently push this into the auger. We're not going to try to break the auger, but gently push it into the auger. Um, it's nice when we have the uh, actual dermatophyte test medium because it will change color with a dermatophyte growing in it. With the DTM color, uh, DTM, you'll get a, a red color in three to five days, but again, you're going to want to do a microscopic examination. <clears throat> Uh, if you use a um, Sabarod um, dextrose culture, uh, you're going to get white to yellow tan colonies. Again, every time I would look under a microscope to see if you can identify it. Um, we can. We usually would incubate it for um, two weeks. We didn't need it for three weeks. Uh, if it was going to grow, it was typically going to grow within the first three to seven days. Um, and usually by two weeks, we're, if we're saying no growth, we're really not getting anything. When we store these, we obviously have to label them and we store them upside down. And the reason we do that is that um, these will condensate. You will get liquid droplets. Uh, and we want to make sure those liquid droplets are running off the medium and not on it. So store it upside down. So how do we identify these things? So um, these are microscopic examinations of um, some funguses. Um, these are yeasts. Okay, This is malassezia yeast. A malassezia yeast will look like a peanut or some say a snowman. These are commonly found in ears or in um, vaginal cavities in dark, warm places. Um, so malassezia pachydermatitis is uh, a very common yeast that we find. Candida albicans uh, can also be found. Co this is Coxioides imitus, um, Cryptococcus neoformans, Histoplasma capsulatum, Blastomyces dermatides, and Sporothrys shankii. So nice little cherry blossoms here. Um, uh, histoplasma and blastomyces are really common, starting to become even more common in this area. Viruses, viral detection methods. So often we use antibody-based tests um, to detect viral antigens. ELISA is our most common in-house method. Um, molecular methods uh, are, um, we might detect viral nucleic acid, so d kind of DNA testing for viruses. So this is a common uh, test for um, dogs or cats. Um, I actually don't know which test this is for. It could be parvovirus. Um, I'm not really sure what it's for. Um, viral detection methods in diagnostic laboratories. Um, ELISA. Uh, virus isolation, electron microscopy, actually looking at the virus itself. If you've seen pictures of the COVID virus, um, the little um, nodules that you see on it, those are seen with electron microscopy. We can use immunohistochemical staining of histopathology samples and molecular tests. Solid phase immunoassay. This is what an ELISA is. 
Um, it's using the antibody or antigen bound to solid carrier. Uh, we can incubate the sample on a membrane or on a well. Um, and this is using wells. Uh, use the primary antibody that binds with a viral antigen in the sample if they have an antigen. Um, and this is uh, when we do a lot of tests all at once. Uh, if you send it away, this is how they'll do it. They'll um, label where the tests go and put the samples in and then uh, put the reagents in and look at the changes. Okay. So how do we get uh, viruses? We get it directly from the patient sample or by culturing it out. Uh, primary cells are isolated from the animal or the cells are previously immortalized for propagation in vitro. We can culture the cells uh, using biosafety equipment. Um, obviously, we're going to want to do this in a specific laboratory. Okay? Um, anytime we're culturing viruses, we have to be really careful and uh, do this very carefully. The electron microscopy, you can see this kind of looks like the COVID. Um, it's a little bit uh, different, but this is what cells look like in real life. It's pretty cool. Um, this is a pretty specialized machine we'd see in a laboratory setting. This is a hookworm with electronic microscopy. Okay. Immunohistochemical staining. This is to examine infected culture cells, cult, infected cultured cells for pa uh, or patient samples for virus presence. We take a primary antibody used for virus detection, um, which is derived by inject injecting animals with the virus or antigen, and then purifying the resulting antibodies from the serum of the animal. Uh, we use monoclonal antibodies preferred over polyclonal. So we're just we're making antibody, and we're um, using it to detect the virus. And then we um, we we label that with a color or radiation in order to be able to detect it. Uh, DNA sequencing we can use this. Uh, it's expensive, um, but we can use it to do DNA sequ sequencing on viruses as well. Um, this is an example of how DNA sequencing is, sequencing is done. Um, so if you were ever curious. Um, and um, maybe a drop of blood or your saliva or urine or, or even feces, um, anything that might have a cell of yours in it or a cell of the bacteria in it, and they're going to uh, raise the temperature um, to about 90 degrees and separate those uh, strands of DNA. Um, then we're going to take... Um, lower it and put in synthetic DNA and then you're going to cycle that and until you got things kind of changed up a little bit and then you're going to put it through the copy machine the PCR copy machine until you have a ton of it copied out you've got millions of copies of this once you have millions of copies it's a lot easier to actually look at the DNA Let's talk real quick about nosocomial infections. These are infections that are acquired from the hospital environment, another patient, or a healthcare provider. We've just talked about some pretty serious bacteria and uh, fungus, fungal infections that you can get if you are not being careful. You're not wearing gloves, you're not washing your hands. You can get them and you can give them to other patients, other clients, and that can be a problem. Contributing factors are patient related. So if you have a patient that is coughing or barking into another patient's face uh, when they come into the waiting room, that's a problem. Uh, you can be pathogen related. So depending on how infectious this disease is, they could just walk through the parking lot and give the disease to other patients. Could be environmental. Your, your environment could not be very clean. Or your veterinary personnel may not be cleaning themselves between pets. That's a problem. Um, there are different forms. Um, some nosocomial infections are virulent, meaning they actively seek out uh, other uh, things to uh, infect, or opportunistic. They just happen to be in the environment. In some cases, the patient's vaccination status can affect his or her, her susceptibility to infections. So if you have an animal with parvo that comes into the clinic, and then your next case is an animal uh, that has no vaccines, you're going to have a problem. Um, nosocomial agents are called fomites. These are things that can be their objects that can be um, uh, transmitted on physical items such as food bowls, cage mats, clippers, thermometers, any other item in close contact with a patient. So anything that comes into contact with an animal who might be contagious needs to be cleaned as well. So good hygiene is critical in patient care. 
Some agents of nosocomial infection would be bacteria, viruses, fungi, and parasites. Frequency of agents in nosocomial infection. Drug-resistant bacteria is the most frequent cause of nosocomial infections. So methicillin-resistant staphylococci, vancomycin-resistant enterococci. Um, enterococci means um, cocci that live in the uh, uh, intestinal tract uh, that are dangerous. Um, Multi-drug resistant gram-negative organisms, E. coli, Salmonella, Klebsiella, Enterobacter, and Pseudomona. Those are all, all uh, things that we find are problems with nosocomial infections. Um, viruses, um, canine distemper, canine parvovirus, feline panleukopenia, equine influenza and equine herpes virus, and then other respiratory viral pathogens um, that can like Bordetella, um, equine flu, uh, those are, um, and bovine uh, respiratory uh, viral things that um, can be passed pretty easily. So we have to be really careful when we're moving from patient to patient, farm to farm, room to room, um, that we're keeping things as clean as possible. So we want to respond to nosocomial infection by recognizing um, making sure we've identified the source and that we have a multiple intervention approach. So keeping things clean is huge. And you may see this a lot more with a COVID um, uh, pandemic that people are paying a little bit more attention to keeping things clean and what might be infected. So routine disinfection of housing, equipment, and treatment areas, monitoring the system for consist consistent procedure. If you have somebody new coming in, make sure they're following pro protocols and procedures. Thorough analysis of all practices and potential sources. You should be looking at these things all the time. I have uh, further slides in this lecture that you're welcome to go through. Um, if stay, like I say, stay curious. You want to be curious uh, through this whole program. Um, you are going to need some, to know some of these things that are included uh, in the chapter, but not in the lecture. What you need to know for the quiz and for the test is in the lecture, um, but Part of that is that I'm going to cover some of this other stuff later on in the program, and part of this is I'm expecting you to stay curious and to um, to educate yourself. If you have any questions at this point, bring it to class.